Hi, welcome back to Zifari, the zombie novel. Today we're going to read the second part of chapter 19 when we find out what happens in the experiment in the basement lab. Wow! If you're ready, give it a shot. Here we go. Allison had uploaded all of the data from the electromagnetic sensors to the lab's mainframe before she had left for home last night. But she was not going to touch Willie's mangled body. No fucking way. She arrived at the lab before Dr. Prick Thursday morning. Ike was on a job for his new employer, so she had spent a terrible night alone. She had cried herself to sleep by midnight, tossed and turned and woke up again about two, and then cried herself to sleep again, waking up exhausted at five. She took a long, hot shower and washed her hair, shaved her legs and under her arms, and still felt dirty. She couldn't eat. She was certain that if she had placed even the smallest bite of anything in her mouth, she would have thrown up so violently that she would have been unable to stand. There was coffee in the patrol cafeteria, thank God. She bought two large cups and carried them to the lab with her. When she walked out of the elevator, she walked to the, her desk like the zombie she worked with and set the cups down, noticing nothing but the pool of her vomit on the floor from yesterday. As she walked to the cabinets and sink on the wall, she saw something out of the corner of her eye. Something had moved. There was nothing anywhere in the lab that should be able to move. The zombie was strapped in, and everything else was heavy and stationary. She turned slowly in the direction she had noticed the motion, ready to scream. Then her gaze fell on the cube. Willie Lace still lay there, bloody and now gray, against the side of the cube. Allison looked closely, focusing her attention on Willie's corpse. His finger moved. Allison Hayes shook her head and blinked her eyes, and Willie moved his finger again. Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, she swore to herself. Willie's not dead. She ran to her desk and called Dr. McDougall. McDougall rushed out of the elevator into the lab less than 15 minutes later. His shirt was untucked and his buttons were buttoned one button off. His shoelaces were flapping and his hair was not even close to being combed. He ran to the side of the cube where Willie's body lay. McDougall slid down the glass so that his face was just an inch or so higher than Willie's. The doctor stayed there, face pushed against the glass for five minutes, and then for five minutes more. And then he jumped to his feet and yelled, It opened its eyes! It opened its eyes! Willie's a zombie! A zombie! Dr. McDougall was not about to endanger himself or soil his hands by attempting to move his new zombie to its restraint chair. He called the troop dispatcher, and within five minutes, four heavily muscled troopers appeared from the elevator. They opened the cube and moved a still lethargic Willie to its restraint chair. They strapped the undie in and left. Dr. McDougall realized that a zombie required a few more specialized restraints than a still human subject, so he got on the Amazon.com website and found his favorite department. He could have kicked himself for not bookmarking his searches. There were 20 pages of bondage gags. Wait a second. He found his order history and clicked on the link he had used before. There it was. Leather and chrome steel, open mouth, one size fits most, leather head harness, still 31 bucks with free two-day shipping. With a plug gag, McDougall ordered five. The experiments would continue and maybe Mrs. McDougall would enjoy one. Jerry and Willie sat next to each other, seemingly oblivious of the other's proximity, in restraint chairs that could easily be moved to, to or into the cube. Dr. McDougall would need to find more human subjects, but that could wait until he determined the secret of Willie's zombification. McDougall sat at his desk and reviewed all of the data. The olfactive and audio information was of no help. He discarded the stereoscopic imaging, but kept two of the HD cameras recordings. Then he began to search through the electromagnetic sensors data. The X-ray collector's evidence indicated nothing. The UV sensor's information was equally unhelpful. The infrared and microwave sensors showed nothing. The third time McDougall reviewed the, the terahertz measurements, he noticed a tiny change, just about the time it appeared that Willie gave up the ghost. It took two hours more, but McDougall was finally able to sync the HD cameras with the terahertz readings. When he did this and reviewed it in very slow motion, he thought he might have seen something like mist flowing up from Willie's open mouth into Jerry's. McDougall watched it again and again and again and again to make sure that he hadn't made a mistake. Yes, there it was, but what was it? He racked his brains, but no light went on. 
What had he forgotten? In his frustration, he brushed a paper off his desk onto the floor. When he bent to pick it up, he noticed that it was the printout, comparing Willie's pre-phase four weight with his post-phase four weight, 190.7 pounds before and 190.6845676 pounds after, just a little. The doctor examined the conversion to grams, 86,500.065 grams before, 86,493.065 grams after, exactly 7 grams. 7 grams. And then he remembered that quack. What was his name? No matter. 1901. He had measured the mass of six patients before and right after the moment of death and found a difference of 21 grams. When he reproduced the experiment with six dogs, there was no difference. He posited, therefore, that the human soul weighed 21 grams. And then Dr. McDougall remembered his reading. Followers of the voodoo faith and many other beliefs worldwide believe in dualism, that the human soul has two parts. The voodoo-sans believe that the gros bonage is a person's conscience and personality, and the t-bonage is a person's spirit. A big guardian angel and a little guardian angel. Two-thirds of the soul and one-third of the soul. Maybe the savage servants of the soul from that jungle land knew more than anyone suspected. He would have to work on refining his theory, but he had a lab and the equipment he needed. This discovery would be his and his alone. Wait, that Hayes woman. She would try to horn in on his glory and steal the recognition for his discovery. And then he saw his salvation. He was ecstatic. There it was, the excuse to fire her pushy ass. She had snuck into an expensive sensory array when he had specifically ordered her not to. That was cause to fire her. Insubordination. The fact that he had found evidence of the source of zombification from the terahertz sensors would not be apparent until he published his findings. That would take a year. By then, she'd be long gone, back to her double wide in a trailer park somewhere in Kansas City. And there would be no reason to mention her name as part of his investigation.